wise and the foolish bridesmaids. In the middle of the night, when they were all sleeping, the cry came out, the bridegroom has arrived. This morning we rejoice because the bridegroom, Jesus, has come. He comes to us today in bread and wine. He comes to us, his bride, the church. He nourishes us. He loves us. He treats us with tenderness and love and compassion and strengthens us to go out into the world to be his disciples. For the last two weeks, we have had the privilege of being able to sing. Unfortunately, that privilege has now been suspended again because of the rising number of cases of infection. And so we are not able to sing, but we will still have music at various points of the service to help us to connect closer with the Spirit of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be His name, now and forever. Glory to God in the highest. And, and peace to His people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. <coughs> we say together, Almighty God, to, to whom all hearts are open, all desires flow, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So let us confess our sins and firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, be penitent, we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have made about our own. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in the midst of life, to the glory of God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon your sins and set you free from them, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Imminent God, you expect us to be vigilant in the night of sin and death. Wake us from our sorrow and call us forth to greet Christ, that we may follow him to eternal light. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from uh, the book of 
Joshua said to the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago your forefathers, including Terah and the father of Abraham and Nabal, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. Now fear the Lord and serve him with faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord, because he is our God. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, He will turn and bring disaster upon you and make an end of you after He has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and heal your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Lord said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people and there at Shechem he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the Lord of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak, near the holy place of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord.
those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we will tell you that we who are still alive, who are left on the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks. Holy Week. Things are coming to a triumphant and dramatic conclusion in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus has entered Jerusalem along with many, many other pilgrims for the Passover, and he has been acclaimed by his fellow pilgrims as a king, the one who is going to come and change everything. If only they knew how. On entering Jerusalem, 
Jesus goes to the temple and he begins stirring things up dramatically. He overturns the tables of the money changers. He drives out the dealers in animals. He engages in disputes with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who are in charge of the temple and all that it does. He argues with them. He denounces them as hypocrites. He denounces the whole system that they represent as being outdated, outmoded, obsolete. He has come to replace it. He has come to be the new temple, the new place of sacrifice, God's presence and forgiveness for his people. And he ends that discourse by predicting that the temple will be destroyed. And not just the temple, but the whole city. Every stone will, not one stone will be left on another, he says. The temple will be destroyed. He then leaves the temple and leaves the city, and with his disciples, he goes back up to the Mount of Olives. And when they are together privately, his disciples quite understandably ask him, when is all this going to happen? And what will the sign be that you are about to return and make everything new? So the first question, when is all this going to happen? When is the temple going to be destroyed and so on? His answer is quite simple. It will happen within the lifetime of this generation. Most of those who are listening to him would see for themselves the destruction of the temple and the city. And indeed, about 40 years later, it happened. The Romans came. There had been a long period of rebellion on the part of the Jewish people. And the Romans finally crushed it brutally by destroying the city and putting to death many, many people. So Jesus predicted that this would happen within the lifetime of most of those there. But as far as the second part of the question goes, it's a different issue entirely. When, what, what will the sign be, if they ask, that you are going to return, the parousia, the second coming, how will we know when it's going to happen? What can we look out for to know that it's about to take place? Again, his answer to them is fairly simple, initially. That answer is that nobody knows. Even Jesus himself does not know the time of his coming, and certainly no humans do. All that is in the realm of the Father's knowledge, and nobody else knows, not even the Son. To which you could quite understandably go along with the disciples in their wondering, well, how then can we be ready for it if we don't know when it's going to happen? If we knew it was going to happen at a particular time, we could make sure we were ready. But if we don't know, then how can we be ready for it? So in chapter 25 of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus speaks to his disciples with three parables which all talk about readiness for the coming of the Son of Man. The first, which we would have heard last week if our readings hadn't been interrupted by the Saints Day, the first is the parable of the slaves waiting for the return of their master. And remember, this is, Jesus draws a distinction between the, the good and wise steward or slave and the lazy one. The good slave is the one who looks after his master's household while the master is away. He takes care of all the workings of the house. He makes sure that the other servants, or the other slaves, are supervised, that they all do their work, and things are run properly. So when the master returns, he will reward this slave for being, for being diligent and trustworthy. Whereas the dishonest slave is quite the opposite. He takes advantage of his master's absence to sit, sit around, eating and drinking, and letting the rest of the servants do whatever they like. And when the master comes back and finds his house in disarray, that servant will be punished. And in typically lurid language, Jesus speaks about this servant being punished severely, being cut in two, and being consigned to the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's quite how you gnash your teeth when you're being cut in two, I don't know. But anyway, it is a message about being prepared for the unexpected return of the Master. Next week's parable, which I won't speak too much about because that will mean we have no 
the sermon next week. Next week is the parable of the talents. Again, the master goes away and he entrusts three of his servants with a great deal of money. And when he comes back, he wants to know what they've been doing with it while he's been away. It's a slightly different angle, but the story is the same. Make good use of what you've been entrusted with. Today's parable is slightly more difficult to understand. The parable of the wise and the foolish bridesmaids. Again, it is just a story. It's not based on a true occasion. It's just Jesus making up a story which his hearers would have understood and using that to help them understand something. The story is the wedding banquet, the, the, the whole of the wedding, not just the banquet, which in Jewish culture at the time took a long time, several days. We don't know all that much about Jewish wedding customs at the time, but we know a little bit. So we can understand that things took a long time. There was always a lot of waiting around for people to arrive. Then when they arrived, the celebrations could begin. So the five bridesmaids were waiting for the bridegroom to appear. When he appeared, then the feast could begin. Five of them, as we heard, were wise. They brought lamps and they brought spare oil for their lamps. Whereas the foolish ones, the remaining five, brought their lamps but they didn't bring any spare oil. When the cry went up at midnight that the bridegroom was come, they all woke up. They all tried to light their lamps. But the foolish ones realized that they had no oil left. The upshot of it was that they had to go off and find oil, and they missed the chance to get into the wedding feast. It's a very curious parable. How could the bridegroom, how could the bridegroom say to these five bridesmaids, I don't know you? Of course he knew them. He'd invited them. He'd asked them to take these places of honor in, in the wedding feast. How could he say he didn't know them? Well, perhaps this harks back to an earlier saying of Jesus. It is not only those who say to me, Lord, Lord, who will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who have done the will of my Father. Those who have said to him, Lord, Lord, but have not done the will of the Father, he says, I do not know you. Perhaps that is what he's talking about here in this parable too. Of course he knows who they are, but he doesn't know them because they don't know the Father. But the upshot of the parable is, be prepared. It's not about staying awake. After all, both the wise and the foolish bridesmaids fell asleep. It's about being prepared. We have to understand this parable in the context of the other two that go before and after. Because it is the parable of the slave and the waiting for the return of the master, and the parable of the talents that help us to understand what preparedness really means. Are you prepared for the coming of Jesus? We like to think, oh yes, yes, that's fine. But we know in the back of our minds it's not going to happen. In my lifetime, we've gone 2,000 years and he hasn't come back yet. I, I'm, I'm okay. Don't need to worry too much. And that's fine. What we don't have to do is to live in a constant state of red alert, thinking that Jesus is coming any moment now, looking anxiously for the signs, trying to interpret what's going on in the world, to see if these are the end times. Many people get obsessed with that. I don't. I don't understand it and I don't think it's necessary. When Jesus talks about being prepared, we have to understand it in the context of what he spoke in those two parables, the, master, the, the steward waiting for the master's return and the talents. Preparedness is not being constantly watchful for the signs of Jesus' return. Preparedness means doing what you've been entrusted with while he's away. And what have we been entrusted with? We've been entrusted with the good ordering of his household, which is both the church and the world. He has entrusted his people, his world, to us. We talk very often about the natural world, the environment around us, being entrusted to us by God to care for. It's also about the people on the world. The people of the world are God's people. He has entrusted them to us to care for. He has entrusted us to each other. Being prepared for his return, then, is not about waiting anxiously, looking out of the window, 
to see if there's anything happening in the clouds. Being prepared is about simply getting on with the things that he's asked us to do. God has entrusted us in a general sense with the care of his people and his world, but he has also entrusted specific ministries to each of us. And we all have different types of ministry. Mine is fairly obvious. Rochelle has a ministry of a lay minister. Mary has a ministry for today at least of a PowerPoint operator. We have ministries of team makers, church wardens, people who sweep up outside the church when there's been a stormy day. We have ministries of all sorts. And there are many ministries outside the church. Each of us has been entrusted with a ministry of some sort. Being prepared to welcome the Lord when he comes again simply consists of being faithful in whichever ministry you have been entrusted with. That is the message of all these parables about preparedness and about the second coming. So the question is, what is your ministry? And how faithful are you being in its execution? But there is great encouragement in the heart of this parable as well. It's not simply meant to make us feel guilty for not being faithful enough for what God is calling us to do. At the heart of it is the fact that the bridegroom comes. He doesn't wait for everybody to be ready. He doesn't wait for those five bridesmaids to go and fetch oil. He comes, and the feast begins. In this parable, and wherever similar language is used, the bridegroom is always Jesus. The wedding feast is the feast in the kingdom of heaven to which we've been called. The bridegroom will come, and those who have been invited will enter that feast with him in the kingdom. Today, in the Eucharist, we have a foretaste of that feast. In bread and wine, the bridegroom comes to us. He gives us a taste of that feast of the kingdom, which we will enter into fully one day. And in that we rejoice, because he comes, whether we're ready or not.
teachers, school staff, and all young people troubled and anxious about their education. And the remainder of the academic year, especially those students writing final exams. We pray for a sense of calm as they come to the end of a difficult academic year. Just as the apostles and first disciples knew you in a visible way, strength and weigh in faith that all may enjoy that same personal experience and contact with you. Almighty God, you are the Lord of the living and the dead. We pray for those who have died alone, unmourned, and even unnoticed. We commend them to your merciful love. Thank you, Father, that you visit us with joy and with the assurance of salvation. As we come to your table again, prepare our hearts and minds that we may be ready to receive Christ's just and gentle rule. Amen. Amen. Please stand. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, it is our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. He is the Word through whom you made the universe, the Saviour you sent to redeem us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake, he opened his arms on the cross. He put an end to death and revealed the resurrection. 
In this he fulfilled your will, and won for you a holy people. And so we join the angels and the saints in proclaiming your glory as we say, Holy, 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 Holy Lord. supper was ended, he took the cup. Again he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith. Christ is alive. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread, this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. May all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love, together with Margaret, our bishop, and all the clergy. Remember our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all. Make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with the apostles, and with all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them, and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour are yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. with confidence to the Father in the words our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding banquet. Come now to feast at the table of the Lord. Lord, I am not worthy to receive thee, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
of spiritual communion for those who are joining us at home because they are unable to be here in person. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the bread of life and the one true vine. I believe that you are truly present in the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist. I seek you, I worship and adore you. Since I cannot receive you in the Eucharistic bread and wine, I pray that you will come into my heart and soul, that I may be united to you by your all-powerful and ever-present Holy Spirit. Let me receive you and be nourished by you. Become for me the manna in my wilderness, the bread of angels for my very human journey through time, a foretaste of the heavenly banquet and solace in the hour of my death. I pray all this trusting that you yourself are our life, our peace, and our everlasting joy. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious. God of peace, whose Son Jesus Christ proclaimed the kingdom and restored the broken to wholeness of life. Look with compassion on the anguish of the world, and by your healing power make whole both people and nations, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please sit. We have a lot of birthdays uh, this time, because last week there was a bit of a hiccup and people who had their birthdays in December were congratulated last week, and those who had their birthdays last week were missed out. So today, um, those who have had a birthday in the past week and in the week to come, we congratulate you. Uh, those are Ina Carlisle, who was 91 um, earlier in the week, Mark Gordon, um, and Jenny Thomas, and Brady Adams. Those were last week's birthdays. And this week, uh, Vanessa Abrahams uh, has her birthday today. Then Mel McDonald, Jenny Fry, Caroline Bailey, and Sean Wall. We pray for God's blessing on all of those who are having their birthdays, either in the last week or the week to come. We pray for God's blessing on them, that he will continue to surround them with love and protection, and keep them and preserve them for another year. <laughs> Anniversaries. Uh, we celebrate the anniversaries of Christo and Edwina de Vett, who had their anniversary yesterday, and Roy and Bernadette Williams, who celebrate theirs today. We give thanks to God for his greatness, for his goodness and his strength to them throughout the years of their married lives. Both couples have been married a long time. And we pray for them to that love to continue, that they may show God's love to each other in their lives. We've also had two ordination anniversaries in the past week. Uh, Derrin celebrated her anniversary of ordination to the diaconate um, last week, and Tom celebrated his, was it um, to the diaconate or the priesthood? Diaconate. Right, diaconate. So they're both ordained deacon um, on, uh, in the week gone by. The anniversaries of their, their deaconing was in the week gone by. Congratulations to the two of you. Our love and our thanks for your ministry among us, very faithfully performed and prayers for your continued ministry as you're faithful to God as we await the coming of the kingdom. In our congregation in St. Francis Simon's Town, there are uh, several birthdays. Uh, we are wishing a happy birthday to, I can't, if I can read my writing, uh, Dave Schur, Judy Conson, Yvonne Kazane Pope, Juliet Bass, and Mary Bramwell. Uh, if you are with us, online then please accept our congratulations and we pray for you that you will be continued to be blessed by God in the year ahead. A reminder that our Alpha course continues on Wednesday and this, the, type, the, uh, the subject this Wednesday is how does God guide us? So if you are part of the Alpha course please don't forget to log on. Uh, it's too late now to join if you haven't already done so. Um, if, if you are still interested in Alpha, then we will be doing it again early next year. So please wait until then, rather than now joining in halfway through. Um, a reminder 
also that our Thursday morning services have now resumed. Nine o'clock every Thursday here, and it'll be in the main body of the church rather than the Lady Chapel, so we can continue to be seated uh, apart from each other. Um, if you'd like to come but you, you just can't, then Thursday services are live streamed as well. If you have the means to tune into that, then you're welcome to join us in that way. But nine o'clock every Thursday from now on. Next Sunday, very importantly, is the last for the year of our young family services. Um, but we've had two so far, we had them in September and October, and they've been fantastic. Um, young people at our Sunday school have come, they haven't seen each other all through lockdown, and it's been a great celebration. A very simple, informal service in the church hall, and we'll, we have another one next Sunday, half past three in the afternoon. And it will be a sort of end of year thing. The children will receive the prizes that they would have received here in normal circumstances on that Sunday, and uh, we will have a, a sense of celebration about the fact that we are all together again. So if you have young children or grandchildren or even great-grandchildren, bring them along. But we need to know you're coming. Uh, please let Joy Rushworth know if uh, you are coming with children. Um, because we're in the hall, uh, we can have really a lot more people in, in that sort of space. So there's no need to book it, especially from the point of view of numbers. But we do need to know exactly how many children are coming. Now, I sort of have in the back of my mind there's other things that I meant to announce, but I can't think what they are. No hands up. Right. Tom. Margaret's Times. Sorry. Oh, yes, St. Margaret's Times. Um, the deadline for the next issue of St. Margaret's Times is fast approaching. Uh, you need to submit your material by the 16th of November. That's the end of this week. Um, so please do that. If you have something moving in your mind and you just want to get it down on paper, please do it this week and submit it by the end of the week. Anything else? Sorry, if you don't want to, you just send me back over. Um, Dorothy, Dorothy Harley here at the front is um, starting a group for anybody who feels that they've been a bit lonely, isolated during lockdown, for especially for women who are single or widowed or divorced and have, have felt that sense of isolation during these last seven or eight months. If you'd like to be part of that, that weekly group, it's going to start probably in the next couple of weeks, so please speak to Dorothy afterwards if you would like to join or if you just want to know more about what she has in mind. Please, please just speak to her afterwards. Anything else? Please stand. Yeah.